Hey, hey, Tony Gaskins here. Now, this is off the beaten path. And I told you this year, I'm kind of focusing on the holistic life. Everything that we deal with in life as people, as parents, as spouses, as co-workers. We're going to touch on whatever it takes to get your life to a certain place where you're feeling good and you're in a good space. Now, first and foremost, with this video, I want to send my thoughts and prayers to Damar Hamlin and to him and his family and friends and teammates and everyone impacted by the incident that happened with him in the game. Everyone is still praying for him and hoping that he pulls through. The last I heard today is that he's still in critical condition and they said that he had been rolled onto his stomach to take some of the pressure off of his lungs while being on the ventilator. And it really hit hard, it really stung. And I've been wanting to talk about sports in the sense of for parents because almost every parent puts their children into sports. And I've been wanting to talk about this for so long because my oldest is 15 and he's been in sports since 18 months and I think our youngest is he's eight and he's been in sports since six months and so we really believe in sports and the lessons that come from sports and my wife she ran track in college she ran 800 and I played football in college and before college, my wife, she played volleyball, basketball, track, even did, you know, a little bit of softball. And I played basketball, football, track. I played soccer at a young age, never liked baseball, but we're both athletes. And I was very athletic in high school and I transferred and went to this private school and was in the paper every day for football and basketball. Basketball, I was averaging almost 18 points a game. Football, I was averaging 10 yards a carry, over 10 yards a carry, which is, you know, kind of insane, but it was private school. And so I was playing against a lot of guys who weren't that athletic and didn't really care about sports. And it would have been a lot more had the coach gave me the ball more, but it just, you know how that works. And then I went to college on a full scholarship and played football in college until I was kicked off the team after the third year. I was in college into other things, into the ladies, hustling, doing all kind of stuff that I shouldn't have been doing and not focusing on football. And while I was in college for those three years, I was diagnosed with six concussions. And I believe there were there were a lot of other concussions that I did not report. And when I had those hits to my head in 2002 to 2005, when I was playing college football, targeting wasn't a thing, which now targeting where you go spear with your head into somebody else's head. Now you get ejected out of the game in college and in the NFL, I believe you get a penalty, but that wasn't a thing, and it definitely wasn't a thing in practice. And I used to, I redshirted my freshman year, which means, for those of you who don't know about college sports, it basically means you get a free year. You go to practice, you know, you, you're in school, you just don't play, and it doesn't count against your four years of eligibility. It's an extra year. And so I redshirted, and they put me on the scout team. Now, Technically, I was a better running back than our starting running back, who was a senior. And he was a big guy, over 200 pounds. I was 160 pounds. And even at over 200 pounds, he was very scary. He kind of used to tiptoe out the hole. He was kind of fast. He was pigeon-toed. But when he was about to get a hit, he would always turn his back. And that let me know that he was scared. And me, I would kind of scat back. I would find a hole, hit the hole fast as I can, and I'm gone. 
And if somebody get in front of me and I ain't got nowhere to go, I lower my shoulder and run into them, try to run them over. Well, I was dominating our first team defense a lot of days in practice. And they started getting mad because I was making their lives harder. And they would try to their best to tackle me. And we would be doing goal line, like just 10 yards. And I would score. I remember one practice, I scored like four touchdowns in a row. And I don't know if they were going through the motions or if I was actually scoring on them. But they got mad because the coaches started yelling, cursing them out. And then when they got the chance to put hands on me, I, we, we had two linebackers that was 260 pounds. Both of them were 260. They were different heights, though. One of them was like 6'1", 6'2". The other one was like 6'4", 6'5". And they ran a 4.5 in the 40-yard dash, and I ran a 4.4. And they maybe ran a 4'6", 4'7", but it was said they ran a 4.5. And they were big, and they were fast. And when they would hit me, one of the guys squatted. His, His squat was 900 pounds. So if you can imagine someone who can squat 900 pounds and run a four and a half seconds in over 40 yards, when he lunges into your temple, that is thousands of pounds of force. And I was hit like that several times in college during that red shirt freshman year, probably to the point that if I really looked into it with a civil attorney, I probably could sue the school and get me a check because now people are doing that to the nfl and they're getting checks for life and or sue the ncaa or whatever but i never looked into it and it it hurt in a lot of days it felt like my my brain was bleeding it felt like acid was running down the inside of my face from my brain and it felt like my brain was bulging out of my skull and yes you don't have to state in the comments oh tony do this i'm fully aware of what comes with that type of head trauma and i live with that and the knowledge of that and just praying and doing that's why i'm so active and that's why i work and serving my purpose and that's why i can't kind of sit by and just play to the algorithm and wait forever to talk on things like this because tomorrow isn't promised. And I want to speak on this because so many parents put their children in sports and sports are very expensive. And we need, today is very expensive, except for what I heard called poor man sports. And football is a poor man sport. And basketball is a poor man's sport and fighting you know MMA boxing are poor men's sport and let me explain by what I mean by that is in those sports it's not a it's not a lot of expenses in the sense of expenses that can't be paid because when you get on a good travel team they raise money and your hotel and transportation and food paid for on your travel basketball team. With the football teams, all your equipment and uniforms are paid for by the league that you're playing in. And parents will pay for travel, you know, paying for your hotel, your flight, but a lot of parents don't even go. They just send their child with the coach and the team if it's not affordable. Whereas in other sports like a volleyball or maybe even softball and tennis and soccer, for example, my son soccer with the travel team to sign up and be on the team is thirty five hundred dollars. And so I want I want you to ask yourself like can I right now pay $3,500? Statistics say that like 10% of Americans can pay $3,500 right now. And it's so expensive to the point that they give a payment plan to where you could pay like $250 a month. But I have people paying 
a dollar and 99 cent a month and there's months that they can't afford that dollar and 99 cents to be a member of the blessed tribe the same with five dollars twenty dollars ten dollars we all go through those tough times so imagine paying 250 300 dollars a month and then when you have tournaments they come and say we need another 150 dollars from you on top of the 3500 that you've already paid and then on top of that you have to pay for the uniforms which the base kit is 400 500 dollars and then if you want to have a couple extra things or the parents want a little gear of course it costs more and then when you have to do a trip like we have a we had a trip to california and i fly first class because of the level that i have reached in my business and my life and once you get to a certain level it's hard to go backwards and i don't believe in going backwards if you can afford to go to the next level in business in life but the three first class flights round trip for myself my wife and our eight-year-old was six thousand dollars and then the hotel had to be like four nights and based on now you can find somewhere to stay at 150 250 a night that's still a lot of money that's another 750 the flight you could get the flight 300 to 500 you know maybe 500 round trip so you're still spending thousands of dollars no matter what level that you're sleeping at or flying at you're still spending a couple thousand unless one person goes so on that trip not all families went it was you know maybe half of the families went because again it costs a lot to go from to go across the country and now we have another trip that's out of state coming up this weekend and my son is not even playing because he broke his wrist playing in the game which then on top of playing in the game he broke his wrist the emergency room visit was five thousand the surgery is ten thousand that's fifteen thousand they have programs and things like that that help families out that make it much cheaper but it still could be thousands of dollars on an injury and so off that small thing you can only imagine what a bill is if you have to stay in the hospital for days or overnight and you have your procedure is much more extensive and I want you to think about this because these sports that and it's so many people especially so many people of color that play football and then it's a good amount of you know Caucasian that play football and then you're gonna have other races if you notice you don't see a lot of Asians in football and basketball you don't see a lot of Hispanics you know in football and basketball they're out there and it's growing but it's not at nowhere near as many whites and blacks and it's much fewer whites in football now if you notice i think the nfl is 70 or 80 percent black and it's not just it's not because of white people not liking football because when you look in the stands, it's 90% white fans in the stands. So it's not that white people don't like football. It's just the understanding, the education of the brain. Just understanding more about what you're doing to your brain with head trauma. And what that's going to lead to in the latter years. And also being them being in a better economic position on average and able to afford more expensive sports like baseball and baseball is very expensive my sons did three or four seasons a piece in baseball and you know it was just for little kids to bat 150 dollars sign up 150 dollars glove uniform so just signing up i would spend a thousand dollars on equipment and that was n not even traveling 
So a lot of people, they can't afford that. And then if you're good, you're going to start traveling. And then when you start travel ball, now them expenses go crazy. The team might be 2500 and then all the travel. So when my son was even at a lower level of soccer, when you're good, you elevate, you make different teams. And so when he was even at a lower level of soccer, but it still was traveling, when we would travel and stay in a normal hotel courtyard, you know, Fairfield Inn, you're paying 150 a night because that hotel knows what you're there for. They know it's a soccer field a few miles up the road and they keep up with the schedule. They're going to bump that rate up from $80 a night to 150 or 250 a night. You need it two nights. You need it two nights. And so now you're paying 300 for that. You're paying gas money, another 100 You're at 450 Now you got food every day, all day. So you spend another 100 there for over three days. You're at 750 And now you do that two or three weekends out of the month. So two weekends at the minimum on that travel team, you're looking at $1,500 a $1,500 bill a month to play soccer when soccer isn't even that popular in America and the chances of making it pro are very slim and then the money you make in pro pales in comparison to other sports in America and I say that to say and yes there's concussions in soccer of course not as many as football but it costs so people get out of these sports now there are every team they can raise money for you if your child is good they'll raise money they have a foundation typically they they can cover the cost they can eat the cost there's foundations in your city that may help underprivileged or at risk or lower income families get into sports that cost more money and if there's not a foundation and you have the ability to start that foundation you need to start it one day I'm going to start that when my sons are grown and out the house. And if they become pros or play, you know, in college, I'm going to get with them to start a foundation to help kids get out of the, the inner city and the lower income areas and get on a 15 passenger van and be taking the soccer practice and tennis practice and golf practice. And to be honest with you, we are in these sports that are killing us. We're playing these sports, this boxing, this MMA, this football. It's killing you and it's all for sport. And the thing about it is the percentage that go pro is so small. And then when you go pro, I mean, it's far less than 1% when you consider everybody that started with a dream in youth sports. It's far less than 1%. And so you probably point zero one percent of everybody who started out with the dream but what you have to realize is you're getting concussions from the day you start when you're boxing when you're doing mma when you're doing when you're playing football other sports yes it's possible but it's far less likely and it's far less consistent and i just saw a guy get a concussion in basketball and had to sit out six days at certain point, they're going to ask you to retire, maybe around three concussions, because they understand the severity of it. And a lot of people walk away around like three diagnosed concussions between three and six. And I want you to think about this and what do I have my child in and what is the path for this? Because if you enjoy sports and your child enjoys sports, your child is going to fall in love with whatever you introduce them to at the youngest age because it's really about confidence and do they feel confident and they may want to play another sport but as a parent if you know that sport is not good for them you need to say no and you need to say why and explain to them why because you understand i just went to the game with a neurosurgeon and of course she does brain surgery, so she has two sons who her oldest son has a nice build on him, like he's probably, I think, 13, and, you know, he has a physique that at 13 years old, I guarantee if he took football seriously, he could be a Division One player getting NIL money and possibly an NFL player 
But even with his body type, his mom says, absolutely not. He's not playing football. Why? She does brain surgery. She understands what it does to the brain. When I told her what I went through in college, she literally like mouth dropped and then she started grimacing because she understands the brain. So if you have your son playing football, boxing, or doing MMA, or anything that has a very high rate of concussion, you're shortening his life for no reason. You're putting him into a space and a place of mental damage, and it may not serve a purpose. It may never make him a dollar. Now, for those that are already in it, you deep in, it's too late. Like you deep in, it's too late to rewind the hands of time and go pick golf or or soccer or soccer has concussions too. Now don't don't get it twisted, but just far less football. You're crashing every play. Soccer, you're not crashing every play. So a concussion is it is happens, but far less likely. And so you have to understand that for some people, and I got a lot of friends. You know, my niece's brother just committed to play football for the number one team in the country, Georgia Bulldogs. So, okay, it would be absurd for, for me to tell him, hey, man, you, you could really get hurt. You should give up your scholarship to Georgia and go go pick up golf at 18 years old. That's absurd. So this isn't for the people who are already up there and they, they life already dependent on it, they, their college tuition dependent on it. This is for those of you who you have children under the age of 10 and you're trying to pick a sport. What I'm telling you is, and especially if you are of color and or not even of color, but if you are athletically inclined, your family is athletically advantaged, your genetics, if you put your child in a sport like tennis or soccer it's going to end up being far less competition and I, I forgot to mention hockey i would imagine hockey has a lot of concussions as well and i'm not sure about lacrosse but if you think about lacrosse they're not really getting concussions they're not hitting each other but if you think about lacrosse and you think about tennis and you think about golf like golf has a lot to do with spatial reasoning. So a person who can shoot threes very good in basketball would probably be a good golf player. I think that's why we see Michael Jordan and Steph Curry really getting into golf because a lot of it is just that coordination and spatial reasoning as well. And think about those other sports because there's tennis players that you never heard of making $200,000 for winning a tournament. And you never heard their name. They're nowhere near Serena Williams. Now, she makes multi-millions for winning the tournaments that she plays in. And guess what? Serena has made multi-multi-millions, hundreds of millions, and as a woman. So, we all know that women are not fairly paid in a lot of sports. But tennis, women get paid very well. And golf, you get paid very well. And so you have to think about this like, hey, if my child wants to be a professional athlete and their athleticism can translate to different sports, why put them in a sport? Like, for example, the WNBA. The WNBA and women who play basketball we can't say that all of those women were born lesbian. A lot of those women had boyfriends and were into boys, but because of the masculinity and a lot of women feeling like they have to play like a boy and they have to be like a boy in order to be good at the sport, a lot of them take on a masculinity and then because they're around women all day every day they become drawn to women and because some women may be naturally built in a certain way or may carry themselves more masculine or have a more muscular frame then they may be kind of ostracized or alienated by the guys 
And so they feel stranded, alone, and they gravitate towards what is available to them. And so if you notice in the WNBA, there are a lot of women who are with women. And even on a very high level, a very prominent players in the WNBA are now in same-sex relationships. So it, and even my wife tells me about all the, the young ladies that used to hit on her when she was playing high school basketball. And we, we try to brush over that because of, you know, the, the organization LGBTQIA, they've added letters to it. Now we try to brush over it like we're going to be offending them, but you have to talk about the reality of it is if you have a daughter and in your religion or your culture or in or even in her belief system she's not attracted to women and you put her in a sport that is largely dominated by women who are attracted to women now she becomes susceptible to being preyed upon and approached and mistreated and put in a very awkward position because your teammates should be your teammates. But I used to work with women's teams in college and there was a lot of dating on the team. So there was sexual activity within the team and that's not healthy for a team, but that's what your daughter is being put up against when you put her in the basketball. And so it's very, and then the percentage of that turns pro is very small. And then they turn pro and all we hear about is their complaints about the amount of pay, how, how much they get paid. And at, at one point, the WNBA, like a rookie, school teachers make more than a professional basketball player. And that's still the case in certain states. School teachers make more than some of the professional women basketball players. And so you have to ask yourself, is it worth it to utilize my child's athleticism in a sport that she may not be welcomed because of her sexual preference or she may feel out of place because she prefers men and she may feel out of place because half of her team prefers women. And of course, they're not going to be, you know, and now on some teams, yeah, she's going to get her butt grabbed and it's going to get a little touchy feely in practice. But so we got to be honest. And that's the elephant in the room that people try to avoid and people try to lie about. And people try to say, oh, just because I'm attracted to my same sex doesn't mean that I'm lusting after if any that's what attraction is attraction leads to lust so that's going to happen just naturally and then we have to be real about that so you have to think about this so do you take and put your athletic daughter in a sport where it depends on her like her mindset her ability like golf like tennis and then her special ability gets rewarded at a very high level when she turns pro and she gets or she gets a full college scholarship, but she doesn't have to deal with a culture that may be not suitable for her based on her preferences in life. And then even with ballet and dance, people will go into cheerleading has a lot of concussions. The neurosurgeon told me that. But people will go into these industries and dedicate tens of thousands of dollars and there's no end reward and there's no it's not a lot of benefits of what you're walking away with as far as lessons instead what it becomes is burnout and what a lot of parents don't realize is that youth sports is a way for sports heads to make a living. So the people who run youth sports leagues are people who they love sports so much because that's all they know and they don't know another way or they don't want to make money another way. They don't want to work in corporate America. They don't want to start a, a random business. 
So they use youth sports as a way to feed themselves. And they don't care about the pros. They don't even have a relationship a lot of times with the pro ranks. They care about themselves and their program and the money that their program is generating. So they will then have your child showing up to practice four days a week. And so if you're gonna give that kind of commitment and that kind of money and your child is gifted, you need to look at what is the end result of this? Do they have full scholarships or even partial scholarships for this thing that my child is giving hours of his or her life to? Is this okay for my child long term, like health related with the brain concussions and just physically, is this okay? And is it worth it? What lessons will my child learn from this particular sport or activity? And that's what you have to look at. And so what we have with football, football is what is said to be a poor man's sport. And what it means is in the lower income neighborhoods, everybody plays football. It's also a very macho sport. It's a man's man sport. And as fathers, we all, for the most part, a lot of fathers, we want our children to play football because we see it as a rite of passage to manhood. And we feel a lot of pride about our son being tough enough to play a violent sport. And so a lot of fathers, that's why the fathers who put their son in boxing and MMA and football, most fathers are more so thinking about themselves and their enjoyment and what it will mean to them and for them and about them as a father and not thinking about the child's health, safety, and well-being. And this is something hard to say. I had my oldest son play football for tackle football for a season and he played flag for several and our youngest has played several seasons of flag even in flag i feel like tayden got a concussion one day because i told him when you get the ball don't do all the zigging and zagging just run straight but you don't have on pads and he's fast and he and he could break some tackles like he he could uh, not tackles but he could make a miss the flag like he ran a full field touchdown with some jukes and zags one day and i was completely shocked i wasn't at the game i was on the road working and my wife i got somebody gave her the video i was completely shocked that my son did that i didn't know he had it in him at that at that age but that's how i was in football but one day the coach would always give him the ball when he's close to the touchdown for whatever reason and he went to run and it was two kids that was standing there at the goal line and he went to run like straight between them and they came in to get the flag and like all three of them crashed heads with no helmet so Tayden hit the ground and he got up and he was crying and I'm sure he we don't have a concussion test and he you know he he can't articulate at seven years old at that time I think he was what's really going on in his head but even with that, he could have had a, a mild concussion. So it's risk in anything. My son just broke his wrist in two places, broke his arm in two places playing soccer. Did not think that would happen. But it's risk in anything. So when you are putting your children in sports, you have to count the cost. You got to count the cost. There are benefits to sports because it teaches you sacrifice, it teaches you commitment and dedication. It teaches you teamwork, or if it's a solo sport, it teaches you how to listen to a coach, how to be coachable. It te If it's a solo sport, you're also learning emotional intelligence. You're learning how to control your, your breathing, how to control your thoughts, how to get over tough times. There are so many lessons to sports that Every parent should try some form of sport with their child, even if your child is more into tech things and 
all of that still let them try the sport and pick something that don't pick a sport because your whole family played the sport that's like saying hey my whole family was slave so we're gonna uh we're gonna do slavery we, we're just gonna be slave you know everybody was slave if it doesn't make sense your whole that's why my dad put me in football because a, a lot of my cousins and my uncles played football and they were all good we were very athletic family very fast so here i was playing soccer and i remember being in grade school you know second grade i think it was first second grade and we playing soccer and i'm in the public school system now so i'm playing against i'm not playing against people like in the private school i'm playing against people just like me who come from you know lower income families they come from section eight they come from the projects they outside all day so they developing their fast twitch muscle i'm playing against the kids that's out there and i'm dominating them in soccer i'm dribbling all through them i'm jumping over legs somebody tripped me i remember one time somebody tripped me i did a rolling flip hopped up still had the ball dribble all the way through score boom we get in basketball i'm dominating them we get in um two-hand tag football i run a whole full field touchdown like tayden did i remember one time a pe coach came he stopped everybody he said man tony how in the world you just did that run he's like man look at these knees he started feeling on my knee squeezing on my kneecap just trying to figure out like is some are you are you double jointed that he was a white coach that was back then when they used to say black people got an extra muscle in their leg or something in their knee he literally was like what is what's going on like how are you this fast and agile so whatever i put my mind to i could do it i didn't like baseball because i don't trust humans and i can't trust a man standing on a mound throwing a 90 mile hour ball at me i can't trust that he gonna throw it right down this small little space that he got to throw it and i see people get it right a lot but i saw it go wrong two times with two of my friends i said no nah, ain't sport for me they ain't sport for me so i never played a season of organized baseball not even t-ball i had no interest whatsoever and I did not like football, but because all of my family played football, and then when I hit 10, I started to excel at football. So when you were running back and you scoring two, three, four touchdowns against hood children, meaning children from the ghetto, children from the hood, children that's super athletic, and you scoring three, three touchdowns in a game, you finna stay in that sport. Your family finna keep you in that sport because you might can go somewhere with this and what we were doing as children we were doing bull in the rain we doing bull in the rain so you you in a circle and there's somebody in the middle and the person in the middle i think we used to spin around in a circle think about how sadistic this is really you spin around in a circle and then when the coach blow the whistle whoever you facing you run and hit them head on so i remember excruciating headaches as a child because we that was before targeting and head on head was outlawed and so here's the nfl with all white ownership but 70 or 80 percent black players in a very vicious game it's really like slavery for sport and what you suffer it's only a fraction of them that make life-changing money most of them make normal money like a lot of the players make normal money they they broke without within a couple of years of getting out of there their money is gone like they cannot live on their, that money the rest of their life because the average career is like three years three or four years and that's what they say is the average but honestly out of the 10 guys you know that go to the nfl most of them be done in two years and it'd be people like tom brady who pull up the average you know them guys who play 13 years but they just one person on their team that does that they pull up the average to three years 
But the people you know personally and you heard of personally, a lot of times it'd it be like that. And that money be gone. I got a homeboy that got a business right now. His business is going to make him a millionaire. But he did two years in the NFL and he got 80000 for each year. That 80000 was gone before the second season was over with. So you have to realize this, but yet we got a lifetime worth of pain. We got a lifetime worth of headaches. And guess what? My friend that I'm talking about has to smoke weed every single day. Smoke weed every single day, multiple times a day for his ailments, for just for whatever, his nerves, his, his what have you. I don't smoke. I probably need to smoke if it really did something. I don't smoke, but that's why I work like I work. That's why I serve like I serve to keep my brain active, to keep my, that's why I got over 50 streams of income. That's why I'm writing as many books as I can, doing as many courses as I can to keep my brain active because with all the concussions, you don't know where your brain going to be at 55, 60, 65. And what you have to realize, and a lot of people don't talk about this, this is, this is very quiet. It's kept very quiet. I never watched the movie Concussion. I didn't need to watch the movie because I lived the movie. I lived the life. So I didn't need it. I knew what I was suffering with. I knew what I was going through. And I was a very quiet kid. I was a quiet kid. And if I talk to a brain person, brain surgery person, or, or I mean a neurosurgeon or a brain scientist, neuroscientist, I would like to know if they know how fast your personality can change after head trauma because if a person can lose oxygen to their brain for a few minutes and then be a, a vegetable and like be like immobile and can't speak and can't talk then what happens when a person has severe trauma to their head and i remember an example showing like a twizzler the red twizzler and inside of that Twizzler, how I got the hole, it showed like little nerd candies, the little, the little nerds, the little colorful nerds. And it was saying like, this is your brain, right? These are the things in your brain. And when it is, when it receives trauma, it's like that Twizzler stretching. And now there being room for those little nerds, those little balls to move around to one stack on top of the other one, one flip around, one move out of line. And they're saying that is your brain chemistry and, and it's changing your, depending on the part of your brain, it changes you. So what happened, we see a lot of people who have had a lot of brain trauma take their life or take other lives or have to be highly medicated every day on prescription pills pills or on self-medication like marijuana and i watched an interview of a nfl quarterback who got addicted to pain pills and started robbing homes to steal their prescription pain pills and end up going to prison and a lot of people don't want to associate that to concussions but when you come up especially if you're an adult or you of age now playing football, this targeting thing just been a rule the last few years, couple, two, three years. Before that, it was full on head collisions. And I remember watching sports science and they said that they were showing an athlete and they were showing like him running or him, you know, like going into something, throwing his body weight into something. They said that's 1500 pounds of force. And so imagine being hit in your temple, frontal lobe, whatever this lobe is called, with 1,500 pounds of force. And that's just that athlete that was on the sports science channel that they used to do on ESPN. But imagine somebody that's faster than that, heavier than that, 2,000 pounds of force, 2,500 pounds of force. And this is what we're putting our children through in there it's relative of course but from a young age from the age of four and five they're playing tackle football they're falling on their head hell and helmets trash 
falling on their head, getting hit in the head. And for the men, see, when you come into the knowledge and if you ever, you know, if you ever played football and you've sat down and you've really thought about it and you've gotten knowledge about the brain, then you start to understand it. But the problem is a lot of men who play football are like brain dead, not, not brain dead, but meaning they punch drunk. They didn't been hit so much and went through so much from childhood. They're not even processing what this is doing. And it's guys with lacerated, punctured, with punctured lungs, with lacerated kidneys, with like we just saw um, Deion Sanders with his two toes had to be cut off from his sports career, from his from his life and all the medicine he got to take and all the massages he got to get multiple times a day on the legs so he could stand up and the pain that he in and just think. This man in his mid-50s, you got to live like that for the rest of his life. Can't reverse that. And the thing about it is what a lot of people don't think about is you don't have to be a Hall of Famer to have life-altering pain. You could have just played through high school and have CTE. And I want parents to think about this and understand, like, what is this for? If you got a child under the age of 10, maybe even under 13, especially if your child is a dual sport athlete at 13 years old and you could give up football now, I will implore you and urge you to really think about the consequences, the repercussions, and the dangers of playing this sport. And yes, people say, well, it's dangerous in everything. It, you, you could walk outside and get hit by a bus. Yeah, you can but that's much less likely to happen than when you choose to put yourself in the line of fire. And when you choose every single day to play a very violent sport, that empty thing can happen. And if nothing happens on that field, guess where it's happening? It's happening here. It's happening here. That is why probably 80 or 90% of NFL players and boxers and MMA fighters smoke marijuana. They're doing it for their headaches, for their pain. And even other athletes like basketball, 80% of them smoke marijuana. It's just a wear and tear on the body. You ripping and running. But but look at this. I want you to think about this. And to be honest, I think the next the next two things that we need to sacrifice and dedicate ourselves to is tennis and golf tennis and golf we've never heard of a concussion in tennis or golf i'm sure it has happened to somebody somewhere he hit the golf ball it hit the tree ricochet hit him in the head he got a concussion i'm sure it has happened somewhere somehow he swung the club too far and it came back and hooked him in the back of the head he got a concussion Somebody served it super hard, 120 miles an hour. The person didn't get out of the way, it hit him in the head, he got a concussion. I'm sure it happened once or twice. We've never heard of a concussion in golf and tennis. That needs to be, I'm telling you right now, if I could do it over, my sons would be in golf and tennis. They wouldn't even be in soccer because soccer have a lot of concussion and it's not a lot of upside for soccer. You go into college and it's 30 players on the team and they only get 10 scholarships at a big Division I college. So they got to take 10 scholarships and divide it between 30 players. If they did it evenly, then that means a player is getting 0.3 of a scholarship. So they'll give one player, maybe their best player, who they really, really cannot do without, they may give him a whole scholarship. But most often they're not going to do that. They're going to give them 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 0 0.7, 0 0.5 of a scholarship. And then he got, then the parents pay the rest or ac he has academic scholarship and Pell Grant to make up his college fund. But certain colleges cost so much, you still can't cover the cost. 
But with soccer, they also can do that because they know in order for you to be good enough to play in college, you done play travel ball and your family got money if you done done that. Because soccer is not like AAU or EYBL basketball or seven on seven football. Soccer is different. So parents paying for that. I've seen like two or three emails throughout my son's career where they email and say, we got a player that needs financial assistance. If anybody is willing to donate, please let us know. I've seen that two or three times in soccer. That's not something they do. People paying the money. And not everybody is like rich or anything. Just people sacrifice for what they want. And most of the kids, 70% of the kids not even going to play in college. So the parents just spending thousands of dollars just so their kids could be active as kids. But everybody doesn't have that luxury. Everybody doesn't have that luxury to spend thousands of dollars for it not to pay off by choice. Like if it don't pay off by life circumstances, that's different. But to just choose not to play college, it's like new, now I spent these thousands. Now you finna get to a you finna get a scholarship somewhere. And so this is what we got to understand. And I ain't mean for this video to go that long, but it may be the only video I do on this subject. So I kind of want to make it podcast style and really give you something to think about. I'm telling you, especially with women, if I had a daughter, I would not put her in basketball. I would not put her in basketball. That's the last and no offense to my clients who play basketball, to my clients, daughters who play basketball and to the women I know that play back, no offense, but that is the, I would not, I literally have a female friend who played basketball from a young age. And I met her maybe when she was in ninth grade and she hit on me and she hit on me. She had on her JV team, it was a some. They were older than her, so they were already gone. But when she came around, she hit on me. But I was older than her, and I'm like, I can't date you. You know, you young. And she was like, Hey, I'm young, but I'm off the chain. And she hit on me, and she wanted to date me, and I'm like, Nah, I can't do that. And then later, all this time. Every year, every year, every year, I would be talking to her. I say, "Now, nah, what's going on with you? Now you got your boyfriend, or what's going on?" No, nah, I ain't got no boyfriend. I'm kind of talking to this guy, kind of talking to this guy. Come out later at the end of college. Now she with a woman. She got a girlfriend. Reached out to me. Got a girlfriend. She was not born that way because she had been like that her whole life. She was not raised that way, but it was the culture that she was in and always around it. You adapt to what you around, especially when what you want ain't working out. A lot of people adapt to what they around because humans won't love. So if somebody is talking to you and they really nice to you and then they go to flirting with you. And they go to making a move. They can make a move and be making love to your mind and you don't even realize it. And the next thing you know, everybody, you, every guy you done tried to be with, it ain't worked out. They done cheated on you. Some of them done put hands on you. Some of them done dogged you out in different ways, cussed you out. And then now you a woman and you got this woman over here and she's spending time with you. She listening to you. She giving you a back massage. She rubbing your feet. And heterosexual women do this kind of stuff with each other. So imagine a woman who like women. She could do so much under the guise of just being a woman because women kiss. Women do all kinds of stuff. So she could do so much under that guise before your daughter even know that this woman has been hitting on her. And I have talked to women who from a young age said they like women and they say oh yeah i'll be turning them out i'll be turning them out and it's a lot of women who they take girls girls and women who take pride in turning 
heterosexual women into lesbian women. If I had a daughter, I would not subject her to that culture, especially for a sport that she could get the same lessons from other sports that have a greater reward. Look at what happened with Brittany Griner. Because she played a poor person sport, that's what you call it when it ain't no bag attached to it at the high level. Because she played this sport, she had to go to Russia to make money. So she went to Russia to make money. She took her medicinal and ended up getting locked up over there, sentenced to nine years. And then we had, America had to give up a international arms dealer to get her out of there. But it's like, why are you in Russia? Because she's saying the WNBA don't pay me enough to set my life up, to set my family up. And she a WNBA star. So if a star feel like she ain't getting enough money and she got to go play in a whole nother continent, I would not subject my daughter to that game just because I love the game and I love basketball. That's my favorite sport. I love it. That's my first love. My mom used to always tell me, you better at basketball than football. That was my first love. I'm just, I'm 5'10". So, yeah, I could have been a long shot, but I wasn't finna make it. So, football is a better option. It's easier to make it in football than it is in basketball. There's way more spots on the team in college, way more scholarships, and it's just an easier sport. Yeah, it's a lot, a lot going on, but your position is easier to just get the ball and run away from people and make them miss than it is dribbling and trying to make this ball go into that basket. And I played both of them. I can tell you which one easy. Football, I do it in my sleep. Basketball is much harder, much harder. And I played it my whole life and still was 60, 70% from the free throw line and still can't shoot threes and played it my whole life and was good at it. Top five in the county and still was hard. And so I say that, but football, I get out there, I run all over them guys, even in college. I'm all over them. Still averaging eight yards a carry. It was easy. But the price you pay to play that game, people don't want to be honest about it, but the price you pay is great. And so right now, if you're raising kids, you need to be, you need to do some deductive reasoning and some critical thinking, and you need to think outside the box. And you need to really be mindful of what you got going on with these children and what sports you're putting them in. And you need to look at the pathway. You need to say, okay, how is this going to affect their mental? How is this going to affect them socially? How is this going to affect them spiritually? What type of culture is in this sport? Because in some sports, there's a culture of racism and discrimination. And I see that even with soccer, my son being sometimes the only person of color on the field, he is refed harder. So the ref, if he go to ask a question, the ref get on to him and go to about to yell at him. But if one of the Caucasian kids go to ask a question, ref don't don't get on to him. My son got to break his wrist to get a foul call. And even when my son broke his wrist, still wasn't no foul call on that play and so yeah he kind of slipped and kind of dipped but player dove into him and fell on top of him still wasn't no foul call to my knowledge but i noticed that i pay attention to that so if i could do it over my son would be in golf because you can't cheat him if the ball go in the hole in x amount of hits wale voila tennis you can't cheat him at a certain level you can cheat him in young the ref could have a prejudice and say, oh, it was out when it was in. But it get to a certain level, they got that camera now. That camera going to tell you if it was in or out. So I do that. and Or I would do baseball, even though it's some risk with that ball flying at you. And the sport is much slower than soccer and basketball and football. I do baseball because baseball, if you fast and you good, when you get to the pros, Instead of making 120000 like you do on the practice squad in the NFL, when you get the baseball, you making that to be in one of the lower levels, one of the lower leagues. And then you get to the major leagues, 
you you making minimum five hundred thousand or more, and baseball your money guaranteed. Baseball your money guaranteed. Basketball for for guys, basketball is different than it is for women. If if I have a daughter, I will put her in tennis or golf because she could get a college scholarship, and if she's good enough to go pro, it's it's a bag attached to it. And she don't have to be going to another country for months on end to make money like basketball players. And then think about the visibility. Some people play softball. Some people play volleyball. But think about the professional visibility. There may be a professional volleyball league. I know nothing of it. Have not seen it on TV. There may be a professional softball league. I know nothing of it. Haven't seen it on TV. So even with this stuff, it's like if you playing to become a pro, you need to choose a sport that the pros is actually prevalent and prominent and a real deal in your country. And if that's not the case, then you just finna be a pioneer and you're going to dedicate thousands of hours and all of this time to end up a lot of times these athletes having only been affirmed as athletes end up unfulfilled, unhappy, and it leads to depression lead to a lot of bad choices so i want you to think about this thing and I, i'm so sorry it went so long but it's just it's i know it's a lot of mixed reviews on these type of topics and it's a lot of sensitive stuff that's that's hard to say hard to talk about and i still got the opportunity to work with women's basketball team and you know have said this here stuff about the sport but it's the truth is the reality and I know some coaches that they trying to affect that they trying to change that they trying to have their teams be more feminine and let them know that listen just because you play this sport doesn't mean you have to present masculine doesn't mean you have to walk like a man and you have to talk like a man and dress like a man and look like a man to be good at this sport you can be a woman and you can play like a girl you, you could be, you know, who you want to be. You don't have to adapt or change to be more masculine, to be respected or to play this game. It's some coaches trying to, you know, instill and infuse that in their team without blatantly saying it because they don't want to get canceled. But they see the pressure being put on women who love the game but feel like they're not accepted or respect it or appreciate it unless they present masculine and that's a real conversation that has to be had but it ain't a lot of people that's gonna have it with you know a level head and common sense and then when somebody finally say it they say it so loud and irate and disrespectful that it doesn't even land and it can't even really be processed and they just get canceled instead of let's really talk about this and see and really address the pressure that's put on these people in these sports and, and what they're doing based on the culture of this sport. So, hey, it's Tony Gaskin. God bless you. We'll talk soon.